Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Bicentennial Man by Isaac Asimov. So this is a collection of his short stories. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs before sharing my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Robot as Revolutionary. Andrew was one of Earth's first house robots, clean, smoothly designed and functional. But when Andrew started to develop special talents, which exceeded the confines of his allotted positronic pathways, he abandoned his domestic duties in favour of more intellectual pursuits. As time passed, Andrew acquired knowledge, feelings and ambitions way beyond anything ever experienced by other mechanical men, and he found himself launched onto a career which would bring him fame, fortune and danger. For a robot who wants to be human must also be prepared to die. In The Bicentennial Man, Isaac Asimov returns to his first and most enduring love, robotics. The result is a brilliant book of first-class entertainment and mind-spinning ideas which confirms Asimov's supreme status as Grandmaster of Science Fiction. And as always, because it's a short story collection, he also includes a bunch of little introductions to each of them as well, which is a lot of fun. I'm going to read you the blurb here. So I'm going to read you the content. So we've got The Prime of Life, Feminine Intuition, Waterclap, That Thou Art Mindful of Him, Stranger in Paradise, The Life and Times of Multivac, the Winnowing, The Bicentennial Man, Marching In, Old Fashioned, The Tercentenary Incident, and A Birth of an Ocean. So he starts this here with a poem that he wrote called The Prime of Life, which is about apparently a lot of people used to kind of stop him and be like, I can't believe you're still alive. So I'm going to read this poem out. It was, in truth, an eager youth who halted me one day. He gazed in bliss at me, and this is what he had to say. Why, Mazeltov, it's Asimov, a blessing on your head. For many a year I've lived in fear that you are long since dead. Or if alive, one fifty-five cold years had passed you by, And left you weak, with poor physique, thin hair and rheumy eye. For sure enough I've read your stuff since I was but a lad, And couldn't spell or hardly tell the good yarns from the bad. My father too was reading you before he met my ma, For you he yearned once he had learned about you from his pa. Since time began, you wondrous man, my ancestors did love, The SF Dean and writing machine, the aged Asimov. I've had my fill, I said, be still, I've kept my old time spark. My step is light, my eye is bright, my hair is thick and dark. His smile in brief spelled disbelief, so this is what I did. I scowled, you know, and with one blow I killed that rotten kid. I think this is crazy as well. He says, when this poem was written, I had published a mere 66 books, and now, ten years later, the score stands at 175. That is a lot of books. So we have uh, the three laws of robotics, I remind a few guys here, are uh, number one, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Two, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. We get some references to Suvin Calvin, who, uh, who is one of, one of the really important figures in, in Asimov's robot series. So basically they want to create a robot that's capable of creative thinking and so they want a robot with your intu intuition. And um, someone says, the average man won't believe the three laws will protect him if he as much as hears the word uncontrolled. Then don't use it, said Medarian. Call the robot, call it intuitive. An intuitive robot, someone muttered. A girl robot? A smile made its way about the conference table. Madarin seized on that. All right, a girl robot. Our robots are sexless, of course, and so will this one be. But we always act as though they're males. We give them male pet names and call them he and him. Now this one, if we consider the nature of the mathematical structuring of the brain which I have proposed, would fall into the JN coordinate system. The first robot would be JM1, and I've assumed that it would be called John 1. I'm afraid that is the level of originality of the average roboticist. But why not call it Jane 1, damn it? If the public has to be let in on what we're doing, we're constructing a feminine robot with intuition. And then Madarin says, uh, look, one thing the general public believes is that women are not as intelligent as men. I mean, to be fair, this is reflective of his times. Well, let's see when this was, does it say when it was first published? 1969. And then Susan Calvin comes along and she's about 90 odd and she has like a bit of a Miss Marple moment where she's a badass. Um, she's, she snorted at one point. Feminine intuition? Is that what you wanted the robot for? You men. Faced with a woman reaching a correct conclusion and unable to accept the fact that she is your equal or superior intelligence, you invent something called feminine intuition. She says, it is a difficult choice sometimes whether to feel revolted at the male sex or merely to dismiss them as contemptible. Then we have Water Clap, um, which I skipped because I realised I've already read this one not too long ago either. 
So um, here in one of the introductory essays, um, this is this is cool because it shows you sort of uh, a little. I'm just going to read the actual essay actually, just to give you a feel for what these are like because they're quite short and they're really fascinating and give you some insights. Uh, but this also highlights this habit that Asimov has of almost going philosophical, you know, and that's why I really enjoy reading them. Ed Furman of fantasy and science fiction and Barry Maltzberg, one of the brightest of the new generation of science fiction writers, had it in mind in early 1973 to prepare an to prepare an anthology in which a number of different science fiction themes were carried to their ultimate conclusion. For each story, they tapped some writer who was associated with a particular theme, and for a story on the subject of robotics, they wanted me, naturally. I tried to beg off with my usual excuses concerning the state of my schedule, but they said if I didn't do it, there would be no story on robotics at all, because they wouldn't ask anyone else. That shamed me into agreeing to do it. I then had to think up a way of reaching an ultimate conclusion. There had always been one aspect of the robot theme I had never had the courage to write, although the late John Campbell and I had sometimes discussed it. In the first two laws of robotics, you see, the expression human being is used, and the assumption is that a robot can recognise a human being when he sees one. But what is a human being? Or, as the psalmist asks of God, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Surely if there's any doubt to the definition of man, the laws of robotics don't necessarily hold. So I wrote that thou art mindful of him, and Ed and Barry were very happy with it, and so was I. It not only appeared in the anthology, which was entitled Final Stage, but was also published in the May 1974 edition of Fantasy and Science Fiction. I thought uh, this little paragraph was interesting here because he talks about something that's been discussed a lot recently due to the pandemic. Among those who saw my story in the New York Times magazine was William Levinson, editor of Physicians World. In the same issue of the magazine section was an article entitled Triage. Triage is a system of choosing whom to save and whom to allow to die when conditions do not allow of saving all. Triage has been used in medical emergencies when limited facilities have been applied to those with the best chance of making it. Now there is a feeling that triage might be applied on a worldwide scale, that some nations and regions cannot be saved and that no effort should be made to save them. I thought this was interesting too in uh, The Winnowing we get this, uh, this line here. It was 2005 and Earth's population was 6 billion. But for the famines it would have been 7 billion. A billion human beings had starved in the past generation and more would yet starve. I just think it's kind of surprisingly prescient considering how old that story would have been. So I quite like, I quite like this little passage here. Uh, Andrew waited patiently while the receptionist disappeared into the inner office. It might have used the holographic chatterbox, but unquestionably it was unmanned, or perhaps unroboted, by having to deal with another robot rather than with a human being. Andrew passed the time revolving the matter in his mind. Could unroboted be used as an analogue of unmanned, or had unmanned become a metaphoric term sufficiently divorced from its original literal meaning to be applied to robots, or to women for that matter? Such problems came frequently as he worked on his book on robots. The trick of thinking out sentences to express all complexities as a, had undoubtedly increased his vocabulary. Occasionally someone came into the room to stare at him, and he did not try to avoid the glance. He looked at each calmly, and each in turn looked away. Paul Martin finally came out. He looked surprised, or he would have if Andrew could have made out his expression with certainty. Paul had, to waken the he Paul had taken to wearing the heavy makeup that fashion was dictating for both sexes, and though it made sharper and firmer the somewhat bland lines of his face, Andrew disapproved. He found that disapproving of human beings, as long as he did not, as long as he did not express it verbally, did not make him very uneasy. He could even write the disapproval. He was sure it had not, he he was sure it had not always been so. And we get this bit as well, which um, because I've read the, the, the novel, basically there's a, an Asimov novel of this. Uh, this is the title story by Centennial Man. And there's an Asimov novel that he wrote with Paul Silverberg. Sorry, the cat's crawling beneath the tripod. There's a novel that Asimov wrote with Paul uh, with Silverberg, Robert Silverberg. But basically, it's more that just Silverberg novelized this short story, you know. So all the plot beats are essentially the same. And I remember this sticking out before. Basically he gets uh, a human to lie for him because he's a robot and so he can't lie for himself which I just thought was interesting. So all in all, as you can tell, I did enjoy reading The Bicentennial Man by Isaac Asimov. Overall, I would probably give it a pretty solid 4.5 out of 5. Um, it's still not as good as um, iRobot, but I don't, th you know, that's the gold standard for me that I compare all of his other collections to and uh, I, I don't think he's likely to, to beat it anytime soon. But who knows, maybe he will. So there we have it, that's what I thought of The Bicentennial Man by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.